Hello and welcome from a very cold Johannesburg. You are watching this year's CNBC Africa special broadcast where we will be throwing the spotlight on one of Africa's three candidates vying for the top job at the World Trade Organization. We all know that global trade is close to its knees as the world economy battles its worst downturn since the 1930s. So what is required? We're hoping we'll be able to bring you some answers. I'm Godfrey Mutizwa and I'll be joined by my colleague from Lagos, Kenneth uh, Ibomo, to chat to our Abdel Hamid Mamdou, who is the candidate of Egypt, and he also says he's the candidate of the African Union uh, to try to fill in that position. Just for context, this position is uh, uh, being uh, uh, competed for by eight candidates. As I said, three from Africa. Our first conversation is uh, with uh, Mr. Mamdou. Thank you, sir, for joining us uh, this morning. I think I want to put the controversy of the AU position on the side first and hear what you are offering as a candidate to lead the World Trade Organization. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much for, for having me. Uh, what I am offering at this point um, is the, the, the extent of my experience and uh, the depth of my knowledge about the system. I have been in this system for the past 35 years. And uh, I'm sorry, there, there's Go on. Be some Go on. In there. I can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Uh, I came to Geneva 35 years ago in 85 as Egypt's negotiator to the GATT when we were about to start the biggest reform uh, project in the history of the multilateral trading system, which we called then the Uruguay Round, which transformed the GATT into the WTO. I feel the WTO is facing an existential crisis at this point that reminds me a lot of what the GATT has been uh, facing way back at the time. And the reform experience that I have gained uh, through the Uruguay Round as a negotiator and then uh, within the organization itself as a senior official, uh, legal counsel, uh, where I was responsible for the drafting of some of the critical agreements uh, in the system, uh, notably the, the trade and services agreement, which was transformative at the time. And then all the history until I left the organization three years ago, where I joined the private sector and academia, uh, now, I bring all this experience and what I've learned over the past 35 years and say, well, this might be uh, of great use to, um, to WTO members. Uh, and I think now it's about time for the WTO to uh, have a different kind of leadership from the past 25 years. This is no statement at all on uh, previous directors general over the past 25 years who all had a ministerial background. Uh, but this is rather a statement about the, the existential crisis situation in which the organization finds itself today. So this is what I'm bringing to the table. Yeah. How much support have you been able to get so far? Uh, well, it's very difficult to gauge support now. And anyone who says I have a lot of support or have uh, less support, I think it's all speculation. Because the, the official campaigning started only... Uh, on Thursday, that's the 9th of uh, June here in the WTO. But uh, we're not talking about the African Union process, which started a year ago. Uh, and you said in the beginning, you want to put this to one side and I'm following your uh, lead on that. If you want to know more about it, I'll be more than happy. Ken? All right, Abdel um, Kenneth here from Lagos, and um, we're, we're coming, talking about this, uh, this uncertain times where COVID-19 is testing the limits for economic integration and global trade. I'd like to hear what your vision is for that new normal. Well, COVID-19, I think, is, uh, has been a sobering experience so far, and I suspect it will have some lasting effect. Um, uh, the thing about COVID-19 as, 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 a, as a crisis for trade, uh, goes back actually to the fact that COVID-19 is an unprecedented crisis that has affected both ends of the economy, consumption and production. Uh, and of course, if you think about trade, trade is the link between production and consumption. So trade has suffered greatly. Uh, when, when I try to imagine how we will come out on the other side of this crisis, 
Uh, I see that there will be some lasting effects on trade. In other words, um, the, 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 the relative weights of the way we trade would be different. For example, uh, digital trade is gaining a lot of importance because one of the effects of COVID-19 is the acceleration of the digitalization process. What we expected to happen in five years has been happening in the past six months. Uh, and that will have a, a lasting effect on trade. And let me here emphasize that when we talk about trade, the general perception uh, is that uh, people think of boxes and, and containers crossing borders, think of merchandise trade, but actually the reality of today's trade uh, also encompasses trade and services, which, is, which represents 70% of global GDP. Uh, and certain services have come to the forefront as critical uh, for, for, for to face the, the, the pandemic and, and, uh, and the crisis. Whether we're talking about health services, we're talking about transport, logistics, digital services above, above all, which also is the backbone of merchandise trade. Uh, in other words, online trade uh, in goods has 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 peaked because of COVID-19 and, and lockdown uh, restrictions and all that. Uh, services like digital payments, like express delivery, like uh, 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 all the online services that, that, that consumers uh, and businesses uh, are, are consuming now uh, are gaining importance. Now, how is that going to affect the, the, uh, the trade negotiating agenda in the WTO remains to be seen. But what is for sure is that when we come out on the other side of COVID-19, uh, we will need a very strong WTO to make sure that a stable and predictable trade environment will assist uh, WTO members in uh, the speedy economic recovery from the crisis. Yeah. Uh, thank you for respecting my wish to defer the politics for a little while. We'll come back to it. We'll chat about it. But I wanted to understand from your perspective, you know, one of the challenges that you are facing as you take over is, of course, I was going to say the breakdown in, uh, in international trade relations because we have seen a trade war between the U.S. and China. We are hearing rumblings uh, between the U.S. and Europe. And we all know uh, the position of President Trump on some of these things. That's one of the key challenges that you are going to face. How are you going to navigate that one, given a breakdown of your key constituents, if you like? I am not in any way saying Africa is not important, or the Arab world indeed. Well, um, if we think about the WTO uh, and, its, and its nature as a treaty system, because the WTO is very different from other international organizations. Uh, and uh, the, the job of Director General is also very different. The director general of the WTO is not the usual executive uh, that sits on the top of an organization and his or her concerns would be allocation of resources or mobilizing resources or restructuring departments or, or field operations. It's nothing like that at all. Uh, and that's why the nature of the reforms that we're looking at and the nature of the problems uh, are very important to understand. The trade tensions that have arisen between China, the US, and Europe, in my view, are related to um, the malfunctions in the, 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 the treaty system of the WTO. The WTO has basic functions as negotiation, dispute settlement, and what I would call the deliberative function of transparency notifications and countries knowing what each uh, other one is, is doing, and therefore would have the opportunity to have conversations about those problems. The breakdown in that system uh, led to festering problems that over um, a number of years have resulted in political pressures that are unprecedented. You add to that the tendency of some countries to seek bilateral solutions as opposed to coming to the WTO and trying to resolve the problems uh, multilaterally. Uh, that also exacerbates the problem because in my view, bilateral solutions to trade tensions are not sustainable. Um, they're short term, they're transactional by nature, and they're not systemic, they're not principle based. Um, multilateral solutions provide the kind of rule based and institution based 
solutions that would be more lasting and would be subjected to collective accountability from the membership. I'm a lawyer by training. I'm, all my life I've been a trade lawyer. And um, having agreements uh, of a legal nature um, is very important, but also having the institutional framework in which those agreements fit is also important. To back to your question directly, how would I address this? I would mobilize all my um, goodwill because over the past 35 years, I have established very solid um, uh, trust and confidence-based relations with governments, members of the WTO. I've been giving them advice, uh, legal advice and, and, and otherwise about um, treaty obligations, about structuring negotiations. Yeah. I would mobilize all that goodwill to put in place a process where the WTO will become the solution, not the problem as it yeah. is seen now. Yeah, those who write about international trade talk about uh, the U.S. Uh, president's trade advisor, Peter Navarro. I'm sure that's a name uh, that you know very well. How is that relationship? Well, uh, my relationship is, is more with um, USCR, and it's not with, with, with the entire um, setting in the White House. Uh, and my relationship uh, as director general is going to... To, to, to reach the right persons to get the right um, uh, steps taken. And of course, the, the US now is in a very particular situation because we're running up towards the US elections and um, we will see what kind of political landscape the, 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 these elections are going to produce. And this is something to be taken uh, at the right time. All right, Abdulhamid, I would like to take you back to your point about multilateral trade. And uh, um, at a time like this, where we're seeing multilateral rule making not, uh, you know, keeping up to pace with the, today's, today's realities, I'd like to get, you know, how we can get countries to play by the agreed multilateral rules and not weaponize uh, trade. Well, uh, I think the, 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 the two different problems, the problem of um, the, the need to update the rule book uh, is different from the problem of making sure that members um, honor their obligations. Uh, the, the earlier one, which is the updating of the rule book, goes back to the breakdown in the negotiating function in the WTO. Because since the establishment of the WTO over the past 25 years, uh, we have not been able to conclude um, any significant negotiations except two. That is the trade facilitation agreement uh, 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 at the Bali Ministerial, and the Information Technology Agreement, which is a plurilateral uh, agreement, but applied multilaterally to the entire WTO membership. But we started the Uruguay, we started post Uruguay around the life of the WTO with what we call the built-in agenda, where we agreed that in the year 2000 we will start negotiations on agriculture and services, and these were items of priority. Until today, we have not finish those negotiations. We, they got folded into the Doha round as a mega project. And then um, there are several lessons to be taken from the Doha round regarding uh, how we should not repeat old mistakes in new negotiations. Uh, that's a different discussion that I, I, I'm sure you don't want to get into now. But back to uh, uh, the second part of your question, which is how to ensure that members uh, actually honor their obligations that comes to the third function that I mentioned, which is the monitoring, transparency, and deliberative function of the WTO, which has died off. The work of the regular councils and committees in the WTO, which, which looks into notifications of countries, what have they done in terms of trade measures, and uh, how are they honoring their obligations. And if one member wants to raise uh, a question regarding another member's compliance with this obligation or that obligation, that is the regular function of administering the agreements. That has died off because we were supposed to be in a negotiating uh, mode since we launched the Doha round in November 2001. That needs to change because this is where non-compliance situations go unchecked. What I always say is that we have to look at the functions of this organization and this system and how it was designed to operate. The three functions that are like a tripod. You cannot have an imbalance. Negotiations, dispute settlement, and 
monitoring and deliberative uh, uh, activities. And, and that's what caused this. That's why the, the first step to try to, to do in this crisis situation is to try and reboot those three functions in order to restore the balance and, and, and address the malfunction in the system. So let's talk about politics. We couldn't run away from it for forever. So I want to know from your perspective, is there an official African Union candidate? Well, that brings us to the facts, really. Um, I was hoping to avoid politics because uh, uh, that would be more convenient, but actually I, I don't mind it at all because uh, if you go back to the facts, the African Union started the process of um, selecting a, an African candidate way back in July to 2019 at the Niamey summit, where a decision was taken that the next director general should be from Africa and therefore African countries who have candidates should submit their nominations to the African Union no later than the end of November, 2019. Egypt all along respected the, the, the executive council of ministers decisions and the procedures and rules agreed in the African Union. Um, by the end of November, three candidacies were uh, submitted to the African Union uh, um, and they were submitted as candidates names, not countries. So there was uh, Mamdou from Egypt, there was Aga from Nigeria, and there was Lauro from Benin. That was with a view to choosing um, uh, one African candidate by February 2020. I was in Addis Ababa for the whole week of the summit and the meeting of the candidatures committee. And the candidatures committee, uh, recommended to the ministerial council uh, to endorse those three names. And indeed, those three names were endorsed with a view to selecting one of them by uh, the next uh, summit in July. That is the process. Now, of course, the next summit in July was supposed to take place in Chad um, this week. It's not taking place for reasons we all know. So. In the interim, Nigeria uh, withdrew their endorsed candidate, submitted a new candidate. Uh, Benin withdrew their candidate. So the fact of the matter is that the, the African Union process, which has endorsed three names, now has only one name, which is the Egyptian candidate. Um, there are two other candidates in the WTO. And here I want to make a distinction between the African Union process and the WTO process. The WTO process does not depend on the African Union process. The African Union had the objective of producing one candidate. That is a political aspiration. But of course, any, any country member of the WTO has a sovereign right to nominate whoever they want. But if we go back to the characterization of an African candidate, per se, well, this is what the, the, the African Union process that was launched a year ago was designed to produce. Um, the only one that has followed that uh, throughout is Egypt. Uh, so this is the situation. I'll leave the interpretation to you, but this is, these are the facts on the ground now. All right, Abdelhamid, let's talk about the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement and global integration. I'd like to get what your thoughts are for, and for the need for regulatory uh, cooperation and what your vision is for integrating Africa with the rest of the world. Uh, African integration actually is a process that goes beyond trade. So what I would think about is, is the, the trade contribution to the African integration project. And here, I would look at Africa's problems and how trade can contribute to those problems. And um, one of the most important um, hindrances in, in African trade integration as opposed to global integration um, is connectivity. Uh, it, it, it doesn't matter how many agreements we will sign in Africa um, we cannot promote intra-African trade without dealing with the connectivity problem. And here by connectivity, I mean both digital and physical. It is not sustainable or, or trade enhancing 
uh, if you, in order to ship um, merchandise from East Africa to West Africa, it has to go through Europe. Um, that would inflict, and it still inflicts, a huge competitive disadvantage on um, intra-African uh, trade sources. Uh, how to deal with this? This is a multifaceted uh, problem that requires infrastructure development, but also requires a lot of services uh, development. Because without services, you cannot move merchandise. You cannot buy it, you cannot sell it, and you cannot transport it without the services. And that's why the, the, the services backbone needs to be developed. This is part of my vision. It's not the entire vision, but it is an important part. And I, I even use uh, my, my beloved home country, Egypt, uh, as an example. Not many people know that Egypt is number six worldwide in producing fresh vegetables, but why is that tremendous production capacity not reflected in Egypt's export performance of vegetables? Because growing tomatoes on the field is one thing and putting them on the shelf of a supermarket is another. And the, the, the link between one and two or A and B is the services value chain in between. And this is where the African continent needs to pay a lot of attention how to promote intra-services trade and how to develop the necessary infrastructure to provide for more connectivity, both digital and physical connectivity. Now, on top of that, if you have the right trade framework and the right trade framework is not just about liberalizing border measures, it's about regulatory compatibility. It's about harmonization of standards. It's about harmonization or compatibility of services regulations. Uh, services regulations now is a very, very sophisticated field. How are you going to make sure that there is some recognition of adequacy of privacy standards? Uh, if, if you're going to promote e-commerce and digitally uh, based uh, 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 trade, yeah. all these are aspects. It's a long agenda. We don't have time to go through it now. But what I'm saying here is that this is a comprehensive project. It doesn't depend on one or two solutions. Absolutely, 100%. Unfortunately, time is not our friend in this instance, and there's lots of stuff that we still need to talk about. Before you go very quickly, I was trying to see uh, the process now that will lead to, to, to the election of uh, the new DG. When uh, does this have to be done? We, we just started the campaigning for uh, a couple of months, probably. Yeah. Um, and then I think... Um, uh, on the second week of September, the exact date has not been announced yet. Uh, there will start the, um, the, the consultations between um, WTO members to select uh, a director general by consensus, not uh -huh. by elections. This is not a, a voting process. This could now, be when a is that going yeah. to be concluded? We don't know. We don't know. This could be a long one and a nice story for us to be following. Thank you very much uh, for joining us uh, this morning, Abdullah Hamid Mamdou. He is uh, the candidate of uh, Egypt and as he says, he is also the candidate of the African Union after uh, the other two original candidates uh, withdrew. Just for the record, the other candidates that have been submitted from the African continent are Amina C. Mohammed uh, from Kenya. She's a former foreign minister and we also have... Uh, Ngozi Okonjo Iwaela from Nigeria. We all know about her. She used to be the African Development Bank. She's a former finance minister from Nigeria. Thank you uh, for joining us. Do not move because up next we are talking about finding the right energy mix for Africa in these very uncertain times.